My name is Tyler from Let's Get Lost, and you're listening to the 4x4 Canada podcast. And I'm your host, Wes, and really looking forward to this interview tonight, Tyler. I've been pumped about this for a bit, loving your videos, and you and I have talked offline a few times and really been enjoying what you've been putting out there. Unfortunately, Trisha is not with us tonight. She's working a little bit of OT. She was planning on coming, but a uh, opportunity came up and she snagged it. So really want to get into your adventures on the island and your Jeep and everything you got going on. But first of all, I just want to uh, mention to our listeners to check out last week's episode with True North Okanagan. They're a really fun and bubbly couple out of Northern Okanagan area and they're driving a jeep and they're fairly new to the industry but they're still learning and they are still learning on youtube so they're had a couple of fail issues with snow and that in the winter and they're not afraid to admit it they're learning from their issues and they're just becoming better and better people you got to go back and listen to the episode even for one reason to learn how they met because that is a really interesting story that and their farting dog do you have a dog tyler No, I don't have a dog. Their dog loves to fart. It's a great, it's a really funny episode. You guys got to go back, check it out. We do ask our listeners to check us out on Instagram and YouTube. All the episodes are up on YouTube as a audio only. And uh, so check us out as 4 Before Canada podcast on YouTube and subscribe and all that stuff, as well as Instagram. We do a lot of really neat posts on Instagram. Wednesdays, we ask a special question. The past week or so, it was Toyota Tacoma versus uh, Nissan Frontier and all the other vehicles like the Ranger. And sometimes it's just something like, what's the best camping chair out there? Stuff like that. Um, but check us out on Instagram at 4 Before Canada Podcast. And we'd love to hear from our listeners. Uh, shoot us a DM if you uh, have a, a suggestion for a guest. We're looking for people outside of BC and outside of Ontario. Trisha's from Ontario. I'm from BC. So we've done a lot of BC and Ontario people. We would love to hear from the East Coast. And we really want to talk to some people up in the North. Yukon, up in the Northwest Territories. Tyler, you and I talked earlier off air about going up to talk one day. I would love to talk to people that live up in that area and what their daily life is like. Yeah, it would be a really beautiful trip up there. Yeah. We'll get there one day. Sean's up there right now from uh, the story till now. So that's what we're talking about. I'm sure you, uh, some of our listeners have been watching his videos and uh, Instagram comments and stuff like that. And it, yeah, it's definitely on my hit list for sure. So once again, let's bring it back to uh, Tyler from Let's Get Lost. Glad to have you on here, Tyler. It's, it's been a minute. We've been, uh, here. Thank you for having me. Not a problem. So you got a YouTube channel called Let's Get Lost. You're also on Instagram under the same name. And we see you exploring a lot on the Vancouver Island in your Jeep, as well as a few ventures into the mainland. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I love your channel. There's something about your editing and that appeals to me. And I talked a little bit about your editing process. So maybe we can talk a bit more about it tonight, but there's something different about your editing than what everybody else is doing. I, I do want to get into your channel and but first, I want to learn a little bit more about you. Did you grow up exploring and camping and all that, or were you a city boy? Uh, so when I was around 12, my parents got me into dirt biking, actually. So we would go out on the weekends and we'd go exploring up in the mountains. And that was really good. And when we didn't have time to leave the house to all go out as a family, I had a friend that lived across. There's an old railroad corridor behind my house. It's a walking trail now. But we would basically just agree to meet up and we'd ride up the trail and it would take us out towards towards the mountains. And from there, we could go anywhere we want, really. We could get all the way out, mountain ridges over and be gone all day, come home at the end of the day. So that was my introduction to getting out and exploring and learning all the trails around here. And as far as camping goes, we'd go to the the glamping sites and go in for the RV. And that was my camping experience. So the camp, the camping didn't really start until later on. Well, there's something to be said about so-called glamping with kids. Cause I can't imagine, I don't have kids, so I can't imagine camping with a bunch of kids in a rickety old tent or a tent trailer or something like that. Yeah, so, I know. <laughs> I, I could do that now as I'm older. It would be nice just to have that luxury and let them go run around and do their thing and you can relax in the campsite. Yeah, exactly. So. 
what was your first 4 by 4 I had a Jeep ZJ. It was a 97. It was the era where most of the paint would peel off and it would just be the primer left. So it was like blotchy and spotted and I got it stock. And then as I continued to like progress and become a better driver, I wanted to push the Jeep further. So I put a four inch stone lift in it, dirt cheap, and I bought a set of used 32s. And it was open diffs and I took that Jeep everywhere and I wrapped it around every tree. There wasn't a straight body panel left on it. It was just a, it was just fun. And we'd go out every weekend. We'd find the hardest trails we could go down. We'd get stuck, pull ourselves out, try and go further. It was just always adventuring in that. So that was my first introduction to really getting out four wheeling. And I fell in love with it. It, there, there's something you said about having just a good old cheap vehicle just to go out and play with. And especially when you're younger and you don't have a lot of money to work with and some of my best memories are those early days where I just had a beater and hopefully made a home kind of idea. I was a hit and miss on whether you're making it a home or not. It's uh, it never really let me down. It, it's actually my new Jeeps let me down more than that one did. Let, let's talk about your new Jeep. What are you running? I know it's a white four door and maybe you can let our listeners know what, what it is and what do you got for modification so far? So it's a 29th Jeep JL. You, it has a two and a half inch JKF lift on a set of 35s. I got upgrade tire carrier on the back. It has a roof nest condor tent on the top. So that's been, it's been all right. It's been an all right tent. Probably been a switch over a wedge tent. That seems to be the way everyone's going with them. Yeah. I'm understanding why yeah. now. There's, yeah, it's the there's definitely something. Yeah, Rubicon. That that's probably one of your best moves right there is buying the Rubicon, especially if you're not going to be throwing your bigger axles and other lockers in it right away. The Rubicon's on its way, maybe. It it it's on my list. I really want to switch to tons and forties eventually. Yeah, yeah. So I can just push a little further and explore where most people can't get. That's my ideal place to get. Yeah. Especially on the island, there's so much rock and bigger trails and stuff like that too. Whereas out in the interior of BC, it's not quite as hardcore trails, I think, as the, as the island. Yeah, we definitely have a lot of, uh, a lot of rough, rocky trails and, you, and we don't have much mud yet. Yeah, mostly rocks here and yeah. a lot of quad trails, a lot of routes to get stuck on too. Ground clearance is a big thing on the island. You gotta admit, we, we're so lucky to be in such a beautiful province as BC, quite often we talk about how we can be at a lakeside uh, in the morning, we can be on top of a mountain in the Alpine in the afternoon, we can be at, in the desert the next day. And then later on that same day, we're looking at the ocean, right? So it's yeah. a real broad range of topography in, in British Columbia. I definitely had that. I definitely had that experience a few months ago. We went out and we were down at the beach. It was girls running around in bikinis, 19 degrees, 20 degrees. And next thing we're up in the mountains and it's zero degrees and there's snow. Yeah. So experienced it all. Yeah. It's, it's definitely an interesting uh, province and, and, and country for that matter too. So Canada is such a beautiful country. Even Southern Saskatchewan can be beautiful. I know a lot of people don't believe me, but it's Southern Saskatchewan it can be a lot of fun. I loved my time when I went through there. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, what's the farthest you, that you've been east? As far as you can go. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I've stood on the furthest Eastern point in Canada and that was actually my first true overlanding experience. It wasn't off-roading overlanding, but mm -hmm. it was more like cross-country overlanding. It was in a 2001 Subaru Outback and me and the girlfriend at the time, we just had belongings in the back and we went all around the coast of Nova Scotia. We went, did the whole coastline of PEI, the ferry over to Newfoundland, seen all of Canada. That was, it was an amazing trip. I totally believe that. I've been over a little bit to the East coast, but I would love to go back there and just spend a lot more time. It's, it's funny. People say, oh, they want to come to BC and look at the mountains and yeah, the mountains are pretty, but it's the joy of going to a different area. I find. Yeah that like i say whether it be up north or out east or quebec's absolutely beautiful in the fall time when the colors are turning and that but there's something to be said about going in an area that you do not frequent all the time 
and exploring different areas. And then when you come back, you notice a bit more. It opens your eyes to a bit more beauty around your own area. I definitely the, found that when I got back from going across Canada. I got back to the island and it was like, wow, I live in one of the most beautiful places in this country. Yeah. Yeah, you are definitely lucky there. So your Jeep, you got a few mods on there. You eventually, you like, so you want to go to one tons and forties and that. What are some of your other plans you got coming up on it? In the meantime, I need to figure out organization for my trips. I'm really wanting yep. to get a goose gear platform in the back. And I recently picked up a fridge. So I need to figure out power when I'm at camp running the fridge. And yeah, mostly just organization at this point in time. It's that's my biggest dilemma is more, even by myself, I go on a three day trip and when I have all my camera gear with me and my food and chainsaw and jerry cans, like the Jeep is full. I have no room left. So I need to do a seat delete and really get that all situated in the back properly. Yeah, it, it's funny. I, I can totally understand where you're coming from on that, because if you're not organized, things just get thrown everywhere and it takes you twice as long to find it. And you pull into camp and you're tired and you're hungry and you just want to eat, but you can't, yeah, everything's all disorganized. And yeah, I definitely found myself sure. spending like a good 20 minutes at camp when we, whenever we get somewhere, just reorganizing the Jeep from the day and then situates myself at camp and relax. Yeah. How come we went with the JLU instead of a uh, Gladiator? At the time, I didn't like the idea of having the long bed hanging over the mm -hmm. axle. I wanted a shorter kind of layout so I'd have better uh, departure angles. Yeah. And looking back on it now, I probably should have went with a Gladiator. My trips keep getting longer, and I'm assuming they're going to keep getting even bigger as time goes on. So a Gladiator may or may not be in the books moving forward in a couple of years. There's but, pros and cons to each one, right? Wheelbase and say hangover and all that stuff too. But yeah, it's interesting. I know guys have owned both and they say each one has their own pros and cons, right? Whether it be a turning radius, the Gladiator turning radius is not that great. And there's, yeah. yeah. But going back to that question as well too, how can we chose Jeep? I honestly think it's the best platform for what we do. You got solid axles from the factory. What more can you ask for? And lockers on the Rubicon. No. Yeah, and lockers. I had a 2020 ZR2 Colorado, the little 2.8 diesel in it. I had that yep. for around a year and a half. And beautiful truck. It was nice. It just wasn't living up to what I needed it to do. It, it, I just needed the solid axle, and I didn't want to have to solid axle swap a brand new vehicle. So I, I want that articulation on the front axle and the rear axle, not just the rear. Yeah. That goes back to the hard, harder trails or the more rock trails in your area, right? Yeah. No, yeah. The ZR2 would be a beautiful yep. platform if you're doing more cross country, especially that little diesel in there. The fuel economy was amazing. My Jeep gets nowhere near that. So anyone that has a little 2.8 diesel, I am jealous. I miss that. Yeah. But especially definitely on the in the island. Trips, the right. Oh yeah. That would have been so nice. It was like a little Kubota engine stuffed in a truck. Fantastic. But like you say, with the harder trails or the more rocky trails on the island, I totally get that for sure. So you had the older Jeep, you've had your ZR2, you got your JLU now. And as you're getting more out there and exploring and, and camping and stuff like that, what is it that you find that really keeps you going out there? What is it that draws you to the exploring and the camping? Honestly, I just love the solitude. I love getting out in the middle of nowhere and when it's just peace and quiet and all you hear is the breeze and the mountains. I, I just, I love it. It, it. There's something about it that just, I don't know how to put it into words, really. It's just, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful experience. Yeah. And there's so much history in all the mountains around here from the wars. Like I found an old war memorial site where a plane crashed into the mountain and all the mining history. If you go look up books of all the old mines around here, and if you get off the trail and you just walk into the bushes, you can find old little tin cans from when they were out mining, and you can find old boots and all the cables from when they, probably from around when they took down the old growth. You can find all of those old cables from the yarders and 
there's just so much history out there to go see and explore and to almost be standing in the footprint of where someone else once stood. It's just, I find it fascinating. It's funny because I ask that question a lot and I get a lot of different answers, but they're relatively the same in regards to just getting out into nature. I find myself quite often, I'll be driving down a, whether it be an FSR or an actual road up to an, a fire lookout or an old mine or whatever, and imagine being the first person to put that road in there. And just how do you plan that road? What did they use? Was it a Reagan trail to begin with? Or was it a, a D9 brought it through? Or Yeah, yeah, yeah no, uh, some of the roads. And yeah, I, I can agree with that one. Some of the roads you put in somewhere, you're like, how did they do that? And who was leading the way? Because this is terrifying to drive on, let alone blast in and run heavy equipment up it. What mountain sheep did they follow on this one? So let's hop over to Let's Get Lost YouTube channel. You've been doing it for eight, nine months, right? And you've already over 6,200 subscribers. That's pretty awesome. I'm pretty excited about it. It's growing faster than I expected <laughs> it to. It was funny. I was uh, looking the other night and I didn't realize it, but you had one video that it's up to 174,000 views or something like that. And that's, that's it's impressive. Still, it's, still, it's still climbing too, which it's blowing my mind. I was honestly hoping for 10,000 views when I uploaded that. So when it hit 20, I'm like, all right, great. It doubled what I wanted. And then it went to 60. And I'm like, I'm ecstatic at that point. I'm going to hit 100,000. And I'm like, wherever it goes from here, it's just icing on the cake. This is fantastic. It's, it's funny how the algorithm works. I think when I first saw that, it was within the first day or two of you releasing it. And yeah, it was 10,000 or something like that. And I looked back the other night here and it was like 174, 178,000. I'm like, holy crap. Oh yeah. No, it, that one's definitely helped boost my channel. <laughs> Reach new audience. Which yeah. has been really good. Which is I'm really neat. For that. I, have you found that a lot of your audience is from Canada or you got a lot of Americans on there? Um, I don't know if I you have, can tell that or not. It's, it's about six, yeah, it's about 60% Americans for North America split at 60, 40, but yeah. I also have a large audience in India as well, which is interesting. Really? Yeah. Huh. And then I have some Australians in there too. So it's, yeah. I have a broad reach around the globe right now, which I find really cool actually to be able to connect yeah. people from all over the world. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. We're. With our podcast, obviously Canada is our number one and, and USA is number two, but or the country that has the third most amount of downloads is usually quite often Germany. And, okay. and then, yeah. And then Australia is after that. And then I think India is in there as well too. But yeah, I was surprised by Germany being our third most popular country for downloads. So yeah. thank you to all of our international listeners on four before Canada podcast, as well as let's get lost on his YouTube. Cause we definitely love having international listeners and watchers. I just find it really interesting. Yeah. Sure. I like so, connecting with people what? from around the globe. So how can we decide to start the channel? There's been a little part of me that's always wanted to start a YouTube channel and actually going back to when I went across Canada, I filmed that entire trip every single day it was filmed yeah. and put on a hard drive. And I tried to edit it and make it work. And the videos were only getting about 30 views a video. And I was putting so much time into it. I got discouraged and walked away for a few years. And within the next couple years, five or six years, I dived really heavy into photography and doing wildlife photography. And so I was really into cameras. And I, I really wanted to get away from just photography and start doing more storytelling. And I was trying to find an outlet that would be a good one. and. So starting a YouTube channel just seemed like the best outlet for me to storytell and, and really present more than just a photo for someone to look at. So four by fouring and storytelling just went together for two things I really love and enjoy. And that's how the channel started, really. It's just getting out into nature. I have noticed that you are a bit different in your storytelling. It's the thing that there's a lot of YouTubers in BC partially because it's such a beautiful province and everybody has their own little ways of doing it. And I find that yours, one of the things I do is a little bit of storytelling that you do usually at the beginning and at the end as well, where it's not just, Hey, we're going here kind of idea, right? You've got something else to say about it. 
And, and I do enjoy that for sure. One of the other things I really love is your editing. You've got a different style of it. And I don't want to call it dark on the video, but it's just your colors are different. And I think you do a really good job of the editing work on that. And I think that's one, maybe one of the things that draw people to your channel. Yeah, I appreciate that. Like in Hollywood and in like survival films, we have, I don't know, there's something about moss and ferns and just having a more dark atmosphere that just yep. draws people in. Our island is very dark. It rains a lot. So I want to make sure that reflects in the videos that it is a rainforest. It is always raining. It is always wet. And I just love that atmosphere. And so to try and get that across on camera and make it like very clear that it is a rainforest. I just really enjoy that. Yeah, it's uh, it definitely does come across. I think you do a very good job of that, by the way. Off air, we're talking about your editing process and what does your standard editing process look like? You put a lot of time into your videos and it shows, but how long does it take you to normally do a, a video? Start off my editing process. I will bring in all the raw files and I'll lay them all out in my timeline from the start to the end. And I'll go through and I'll, I'll trim all of the unusable footage out and I'll start adding my music in and I will spend hours just listening to music and watching the video to see what works in that moment, because music can portray emotions and add to the footage. So music's just as important and your audio is just as important as the video aspect of it. So I'll spend hours going through that and trimming it down to fit with the video. And once that's finished, I'll do my scripts, do my voiceovers, and I'll add all that in. And then I'll go through and I'll trim the video again, remove any filler content, and then I'll do another run through the entire video. And I'll just take out anything I don't like and just refine it. And it's like slowly just mashing it and compressing it down to the final product. And I'll spend anywhere from 40 to 50 hours on a video. Oh, that's a full-time job. It, it on is. top of it, regular job, right? Yeah. It's exhausting sometimes. I have a full plate. Yeah, no doubt. But like I say, it, it really does show your videos are dramatic kind of idea, but dramatic in a good way, if that makes sense. Yeah, I appreciate that. I really want them to be a polished product when it's finished. I don't want to upload anything I'm unsure of, or if I'm, yep. I, I, I know I can do better. It's I'm going to put the extra time in to make it the best I can with the content I have. Yeah. The other thing too, I noticed is that your thumbnails and your titles always seem to work well for your videos. And I imagine you probably put some good time into those as well. They're not a, what's the word I'm trying to think of? The, the thumbnails always look good. You got that dark, the, you've got the edited photo, which you're well known for, but your, your titles are not clickbaity. So I no, because there's a fine line there, because there's, there's some guys that are known for clickbaity titles and then there's others that are not and yours are not. So yeah. and titles are a fine line because if you clickbait, people are going to realize that's not what the video is about, or you're, you can't deliver on the title and they're going to leave. And the last thing I want is for someone to leave the video. I want them to watch the video and enjoy the video. So if yeah. I can avoid. If I can avoid clickbait and be honest, but have the title like intrigue them and they're left with a question, if they keep scrolling, what is that video about? I need to know. I want to go back and click on it. That's the ultimate goal of the title, really. Do you find that you watch a lot of, uh, watch a lot of, watch a lot of other YouTubers? I watch a lot of, I watch a lot of content that I can learn from. So I don't really so much watch other off-roading content. I don't want other content to warp how I make my content. I don't want to be comparing my content to others and having that influence how I create mine. I more yep. or less watch more content based around how to storytell better and how to reach a broader audience and that, that kind of stuff. I want to learn when I'm on the platform. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I agree with you on that. I know there's a, a few YouTubers I know that they rarely watch other 404 related YouTube channels because same thing, they don't want to be influenced by that. And you have your own style, which is really good and really noticeable. And I think keeping with that, but I'm the same way. You look at my podcast, 
or you look at my YouTube list and there's a lot of podcast stuff on there. There's a lot of editing and even though I don't have a drone, there's a lot of drone videos on there on how to drive a drone and I'll do all the different things, right? I have to admit, it's funny. I know a lot of YouTubers and I will sit down usually one night a week just to watch some of my friends' YouTubes and stuff like that because I just don't always have the time. Yeah. No, I understand that. Yeah. That's the same thing with podcasting, right? A lot of my podcasts that I listen to, I don't listen to many of the four before ones anymore. I used to, but now I listen to a lot of how to, you know, do podcasting and how to do the editing or what the podcasting world's talking all about. And then of course the true crime and the mental health ones as well too. So what are you using for cameras? Oh boy. My main camera was Sony a7 III. I've had that camera for a very long time. That's what I used for my photography for the last seven years. So it's just, I understand the camera and it seemed like a perfect platform to switch over to creating content with. Yep. And then I also have a GoPro Hero 12, my dash cam I run. And, in, and also in situations where the Sony just doesn't suit its role. And as far as my drone goes, I'm using a DJI Air 3. So mm-hmm. not quite the Mavic 3 Pro, but... It's a, it's an in-between. It does the job and it does the job well. Yep. Yeah, it works. I was at the Overlander meet and greet in Vernon this past weekend in Vernon, BC. And there's a lot of Instagrammers and YouTubers there. And Dwayne from Just Sweeping Ventures showed up and I was talking with him and he had a, I thought it was really neat because as Instagram is vertical, whereas YouTube goes horizontal, right? And he had a, a neat thing on his camera where he could put his phone in the top of it and then the his regular camera on the bottom and then a microphone attached to both of them and then he just hit a button and he's recording both vertical and horizontal oh that is cool i need to figure something yeah out. i i was looking at it i'm like okay i gotta i'll, I'll send you a dm after to find out about this because because that's one thing i find shooting for instagram or youtube is you got to have two, two hands going or two cameras going or whatever. Right. So this all synced right into one, you used one microphone and it was really cool. It was really neat. So Dwayne from Just Jeeping Adventures, I'm sorry if you get a whole bunch of DMS after this, but it was so cool. Bit of a technology. Guy. Yeah. So anything like that catches my attention immediately. Oh, it was so neat. It, it really blew my mind. So. I know this is going to be a hard one to answer, but what do you think has really helped you on your success on the YouTube world? To be honest, I have a hyper obsessive personality. When I get on something, you can't take me off of it. So when I was bored one day and I decided today's the day I start my channel, because I promised myself when I bought my Jeep, I would start my YouTube channel. And it took me a few months to just finally do it. But after I hit record for the first time and uploaded that first video, I was just hooked and I haven't stopped and I've only accelerated and now my schedule is filling up with YouTube and this is just what's going to happen now is I'm going to make content and I'm not going to stop. Nice. It, yeah, once you, if you're in that personality where you get hooked on one thing and that's your main focus for, it can be both good and bad. I'd say it's been a good thing so far. I've been enjoying it more than anything I've done in the last couple of years. That's good. That's a big thing. As long as you're still enjoying it. I find a lot of people, whether it be on the podcasting world or whether it be in the YouTube world or even the Instagram world, that you can get that burnout happening, right? Where it's just like, oh, I'm going to do another video or whatever. So as long as you're still enjoying it and weather those ups and downs and you'll be doing just fine. Oh, yeah, no, I have trips planned all the way until December. I'm good. I'm hooked <laughs> up. That's one thing. What do you enjoy about the you, what you're doing with the YouTube stuff? Is it the editing you enjoy most or the actual getting out there and adventuring? That's a tough question. I, I love them both. I think, I don't know. If I were to just be, if I were to just be four-wheeling and not, making youtube content i wouldn't go out as much just because things break it costs a lot of money and it's exhausting sometimes like just to go out for the weekend you get home and you're just exhausted so i'd probably only be going out about once a month if it weren't for creating content 
But when I yeah. add the content in, I get so excited to go on a trip because I, I know I, even before I go, days before I go, I, I plan where I'm going. And in my brain, I'm thinking about how the landscape is going to be and how the story might flow and how I'm going to make the intro based on what's good, where the trip's going. And I just start to brainstorm and I get lost in it. And so I think it's, I think it's the filming aspect when I'm out. I really love because I can see how the trip's going to come together as the day progresses. And I also love the editing. I love putting a story together and giving people something to enjoy and also pull themselves out of whatever they're dealing with in life and wherever they might be, whether they're at work and they're on break or they're just at home and want to watch, sit down with a cup of coffee and go on an adventure from their living room. I, I just, I like telling stories. So I love both aspects of it. Sounds like you got a creative person inside of you. Yeah. I, coming from photography for years, I definitely had dived into the creativity and I, I made a couple little short films that didn't take off. You can't find them on my channel anymore, but that was my first kind of, my first introduction to filmmaking. And I just fell in love with it from the start. What do you find the hardest about uh, doing the YouTube videos? Finding the time to edit the full-time job, going to the gym and then editing. And then you have planned trips and it's just the time it, it takes so long. Yeah, I could definitely understand that for sure. What advice would you give to somebody that said, Hey, I want to start my own YouTube channel. What advice can you give somebody that is you got the basics on the camera idea, but, and maybe have a drone and stuff like that, but are just not sure. Just looking for a little bit of help. Honestly, just That's get a out broad and start question. Creating. I know just get out and start creating content. That's the best thing I can say. But on the flip side, quality over quantity. If you focus on making quantity and you're not focused on the quality, if you someone watches a video and they're not feeling satisfied with it, the chances of them clicking on your next video is going to be lower. So then you're going to be looking for someone else to click on it and you're going to be looking for that audience and you're going to struggle to put an audience together. Whereas if you focus on quality and every time someone clicks on your video, they enjoy it and they're more likely to watch the next one. And then the algorithm sees, oh, this is good content. Let's push this out to more people. Let's keep grabbing more people and bringing them in that are just like that other person. Yeah, building an avatar. You have your little avatar of your ideal person that you're you want to, that gonna enjoy your content. Put yourself in their shoes and create content for that avatar person that doesn't exist but exists. Yeah, that's uh, that's great advice because there's so many people that just throw up a video and it's okay quality, and then, but there's no purpose or there's no like you say avatar behind it. Who is their ideal watcher or viewer? And they just throw it up there kind of idea and hopefully grandma likes it. If yeah, you want to get serious about it, there's need, more to it. Yeah, I feel like there definitely needs to be an end goal to the video. There needs to be structure to it. What is the point of the video? What are the struggles of the adventure or the struggles of someone, what someone's facing? There, yeah, there needs to be a struggle, a solution, a destination, something to tie the video together. One thing that one person told me, and I think it was probably on a YouTube video or maybe it's one of the interviews that I've done, and you alluded it to it earlier, but what they said is before they go out, they already have the name of the episode in mind. Things change because it's off-road world and all that, yeah. but they already have a basic name for the, the title of the episode. And they also already have that storyline or what the episode is going to be more about and you alluded to that earlier and it, it totally makes sense because if you just go out there and shoot random you're gonna have random shoots right yeah you're gonna struggle like i think my trip that i'm leaving on tomorrow i already have a thumbnail in mind i already have a title in mind i already have the structure of the video in mind i haven't been there before but i've looked at photos of the area so i have a, a good uh, grasp of what's gonna be there yeah hopping away from the youtube side what is your favorite kind of wheeling? Oh, in the beginning, when I first got into wheeling, it was quad trails going, finding the tightest trails I could fit down. And as I've gotten older, I find that exhausting. And by the end of the day, or even a few hours into it, I'm like, let me out of this tight trail. I want to be out in the open. I just want to go explore logging roads and find what's out there. 
But I'd say right now, I, I like rock crawling. I like the technical trails where you have to really think it through and pick a line and try not to break anything. Because it's my daily, I can't break anything. I have to get to work on Monday. In response to that, I'm going to bring up two videos of yours that come to mind. The first one is going through some really tight trails. I can't remember when it was exactly, but that was so tight. And uh, our listeners, you got to go back, check out Let's Got Lost on YouTube. But there's one video where the whole video was just like a quarter inch here, a half inch there, the whole way through. Yeah, I was so close to taking mirrors off and the bottoms of the trees would kick the mirror over into the tree. So I'm just slowly working my way <laughs> over the tree and hoping that the mirror would clear by the time the Jeep dropped back level. And it, it, it worked every time, but I had no room to spare. I couldn't even fit a finger in between the mirrors. Yeah, that's when I've had a couple dents on the last couple of my vehicles. And I just, yeah, now I just cringe every time I get to tight areas like that. Yeah. No, like I say, it's, it's your daily, it's, it's your fun. daily driver, right? You don't, you want to have a good looking vehicle. You want to have a vehicle that is not all banged up and you know, you take pride in your vehicle, right? Especially when the price yeah. tags keep increasing. And now I went from a, a $4,000 Jeep to a $60,000 Jeep. You don't really want it to be dented. Exactly. Exactly. So the other video I want to bring up on the same kind of topic is the waterfall. Terrifying. Maybe if you can explain to our listeners what I'm talking about. So there's a, a video I did wheeling the scariest obstacle. Yeah. Wheeling the scariest obstacle. I think that's what I titled it. I might, it might be slightly different, but yeah. essentially there's a, there's an old uh, copper mine up on the back of a mountain near where I live and there's a waterfall up, up there and it's not fresh. It's not fresh water. There's no fish in it. It it's feeds into a tailing pond. So no worries about that. But it's essentially a 35 foot tall waterfall with a 32 degree pitch going up with water flowing down it. And on video, it doesn't do it justice. When you're in the driver's seat, you are staring at the sky. That's all you can see. And you need a spotter. I had Colin spot me. So I was feeling a little more confident. I've attempted it twice. I tried it in my ZJ years ago and couldn't get up. I didn't have lockers. And I tried it once in my Jeep in the summer and I didn't have a spotter, so I couldn't find the right yeah. line, but it's got uh, it's like a shale, shale rock. So you can find traction. It's the only way it's possible. Other than that, you couldn't do it. it would, you wouldn't be able to, it is straight up. And once you're on it and you're halfway up, you're committed. There's no backing down. There's no giving up. You have to complete the obstacle. Just white knuckling it the whole way. Oh yeah. That's not all I break with the yeah, if, if you haven't seen it, you got to go back and check it out. And once again, I will remind people that it is a water going into a tailings pond. There's no fish, there's no nothing, but it is a wicked waterfall climb. It is, it's impressive. You're talking about, you're telling me water, you think those tires are going to slip. But as you mentioned, that rock, it didn't, but it is steep and you did a great job going up and it, it, it was definitely cool in the camera, but I know it's never as steep on the camera as it is in person. Yeah. For no, sure. I appreciate that. It was definitely the craziest obstacle I've attempted so far. I'm sure I'll find something crazier in the future, but for now that holds the trophy. Yeah, it, it's worthy of it for sure. So speaking of Colin, we're, we're talking about Colin from Overlanding Overland. You've done some videos with him quite a bit in the last year. You guys just recently went into the interior of BC. You hopped onto that ferry and got out of the rocks and the trees and hopped into the interior of BC. That's a little bit of a different train than what you guys are used to. I absolutely love that trip. To go from worrying about crashing my drone into every tree near me because there's no room to fly it, to going out into just open vast valleys and having all the room in the world to play and look and the views were stellar and also the snow in spring i think all of our snow is gone here on the island but we were getting into some snow drifts and we were getting stuck and it was still a blizzard and zero degrees up on top of some of the mountains so it, it was definitely a really good trip i really enjoyed it and i i have a lot of plans on coming back to the mainland and you're going to see them pretty shortly here Cool. Yeah, it was definitely a, I, I love that area that you guys are in. I, I know that area quite well. And I absolutely, there's a reason why I love going back there. 
because it is absolutely beautiful. And to our listeners, you got to go check it out because it's definitely a different video for you. And, but it's still just as good, I think, in regards to, it's a different kind of wheeling, but the whole scenery thing, like you say, it's a blizzard on top of the mountain and the, and the drone shots that you're able to get were just great as well, too. There was some, yeah. earlier you alluded to some trips coming up into the interior. Are you looking at going over into the Kootenays and that as well? We do have a trip plan that way. I can't <laughs> give any details, yeah. but it yeah. would be my biggest trip I go on. So I need to figure out my organization very soon because that's coming up pretty quick. Awesome. That's, uh, it, that's such a beautiful area. And as I mentioned before, we're so lucky to have the mountains like that in BC and the ocean on the, down to the coast and the island and the grasslands of the interior and, and the bugs of Northern BC, you know, those, oh yeah. We're talking about that the other day. Why is there so many animals going extinct, but mosquitoes are not? Mosquitoes will live on forever. Mosquitoes. I actually read a book on this. Believe it or not, what a topic to jump on. Mosquito, and the same mosquitoes we have nowadays were the same mosquitoes that existed in the prehistoric era, like dinosaurs running around. They will not give up. They can just, I don't know, the way that their larva can just sit in water and survive. It, it's crazy. That's nuts. That's no, we're not getting rid of them anytime soon. I'm sorry, West. Oh, uh, they're probably my biggest nemesis. What do you do for the help with the bugs? Bug spray. Bug spray is just friend. Same with sunscreen. On. Being, yeah, fair skinned. I am sunscreen all day. And then at night at camp, it is bug spray. So I smell <laughs> lovely at the end of the day. Three days of that and you're smelling real right, babe. Yeah. You hop on the ferry, get back to the island and then you got distancing. Everyone stay away from me. Where have you been? Oh, uh, that's too funny. Have you ever tried those thermocells or whatever they are? No, I have not yet. I've tried, I've tried the bug repelling candles. They don't work at all. That was when I was in Newfoundland. Those bugs were immune to everything. I had the strongest bug spray possible and they're still going through the genes and trying to get to you. Yeah. Some of them are crazy. I, I had a friend the other day text me a picture of him and his wife. The, uh, they have bees and they're dressed up in their bee outfits. And I'm like, you got to bring those when we go wheeling in the uh, summertime. Those would work good. Yeah, yeah we're going now, actually. Hopefully they'll die off when it gets so hot this summer. So, mind you, you guys don't get the heat like we do, so. so it still gets pretty hot here. We can yeah. get up into the 35 sometimes, which is Ooh. pushing it for me. I don't like when it gets that warm, but. That's going to be so humid. It's extremely humid here. When I go yeah. to the mainland in the summer, it's such a relief. When you get on the island, it's still just, it's just humid. It's sticky. It's not nice. It reminds me of when I lived in Ottawa. That is humid. It is horrible. Yep. Yeah. I lived in Toronto for 10 years, so I know exactly what you mean. You walk outside. Yeah, it's just, yeah. The last question we ask all of our guests is what Canadian would you like to listen to on a four before Canada podcast? I'd have to pick Bruce Cook. That guy is a legend, an icon. Yeah. yeah no, he, I think um, he's a, definitely an inspiration for all of us. He still gets out in his Jeep and explores and does it all anyways, regardless of yep. being paralyzed. He just gets out. Yeah. So maybe you can explain to our listeners a little bit about, about Bruce Cook and why you would love to listen to him. I just, I think he's an inspiration, right? Like I've yeah, seen him out. Yeah. He still has a YouTube channel as well, and he gets out and I've seen him doing recoveries and he just yep. pops out of his Jeep and gets over and, and does the dirty work and crawls back into his Jeep. And if he can get out and do all of that, there's no reason none of us can. Exactly. So Bruce Cook is a motorcycle freestyler and he ended up breaking his back at a Nitro Circus event uh, a number of years ago. And he as Tyler mentioned, is still out there wheeling and stuff like that. He's actually ridden a motorbike, even with those a paraplegic. And he's done the, some pretty big stunts with his wheelchair as well, too. Like it was a double backflip or something like that. He did a while ago. The guy is just, a, yeah. he's insane as far as I'm concerned, but insane in a good way. So, yeah. yeah, I am. Um, I, I got to reach out to him again. I did reach out to him a while ago, but I got to reach out to him again because I would love to hear more of his story. I think he'd be a really good guest on your podcast. Yeah, definitely. Anybody else you can think of? 
Gone one. I, One's good. That's if you want this whole. Yeah, no, I can't think of anyone else. Yeah. I, I think you've covered so many people. It's hard. We have had some wonderful guests for sure. It, and we've got some really neat ones coming up. We're just trying to get some dates confirmed and stuff like that. So it, yeah, we've had some really good guests and. I do want to mention to our listeners that if there's somebody, whether you want to come on the show as a guest or whether you have somebody in mind that you would love to hear on the guest, shoot us an email off the website or shoot us a DM through Instagram and we'd love to uh, put them on the list. It's funny, Tr Trisha and I are going over the list a while ago and I've got a list and picks a, you know, oh, we'll pick this guy or this woman or whatever, right? And but Trisha was looking at my list and she's, there is seven pages of like, there's so many awesome people around. So that's good. Good to have uh, too many guests to pick from the not enough. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's definitely, we want to, that's one of the reasons we asked this question, because there's so many people that both Trish and I don't know or haven't heard about that. It's like, oh, that would be really interesting. So we've had some really great recommendations and really looking forward to some of these guests, you know, coming up in the future. So. I'm looking. It's going to be great. We got some really neat things coming. Once again, we're listening to Tyler from Let's Get Lost on YouTube and Instagram. Check him out. Oh, one more thing before we leave, Tyler. I do want to mention that my good friends Clayton and Stephanie from Skyward Overland have just released their first video on YouTube. So you guys got to check it out. It's actually a really great one where he royally fucks up. And oh, I'm going to have to go check this out. Yeah. You, he leaves you hanging. The start of the, the, his little intro is I've just made the worst mistake in my life kind of idea. And then gets into the video and okay. he, he really screws, screws up and he leaves you hanging for that second video. So it's coming. He's a bit like yourself in regards to, he's a perfectionist. He's like, it took me so long to make this stupid video, but he was, I wanted it to be perfect. And so yeah, Clay, Clayton and Stephanie from Skyward Overland, they have two Jeeps. They've got a Gladiator and they've got a his and hers and they deckled up the same. They look sharp. So they go in adventuring oh, as I a couple I in separate vehicles. So yeah, though they're and a super nice couple as well too. But uh, yeah, check them out on uh, YouTube at Skyward Overland as well as on Instagram. But in the meantime, let's hop back to Tyler. Let's get lost Overland. Check them out on, on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe. And I am so looking forward to some of your adventures coming up. I'm looking forward to sharing them. And again, I appreciate your Not a problem. It's been a pleasure, man. And we will definitely chat soon.